from above, as the sun hangs low on the horizon, a wide river winds through dense trees. Title, Gentle Giant, The Mystery of the Gulf Sturgeon. Frank Perenka, retired U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a fish that one can come to love, but then the bottom line is you just can't trust them. <laughs> you know? They're gonna change. There's gonna change. They're gonna show you something different every time. A large fish leaps. Dr. Kansulek. Like that. They make clicks, and those clicks travel a long way underwater, and it lets the other sturgeon know that this is the area where everybody is, and you need to be over here with the rest of us clicking away. A sturgeon glides along a riverbed. A man sings from the edge of a small boat. We got ourselves a baby sturgeon. Not that small, it's a baby, a baby. Mike Randall. That first, say, six months of the life is almost a complete black hole. They get up to seven or eight feet long and up to about 200 pounds. They're one of the most docile fishes in creation. Adam Kayser holds a fish. Anything this size is most certainly a female. It takes them uh, quite a few years, decades, to get to be this big. Someone pointed this out to me once. Um, the scoots on the underbelly look like hearts. <laughs> I guess they do. Holds the sturgeon on its back. OK, flip. Yep. Two men turn it over in the water. This animal is like a computer already, you know, and he's just been around. 150 million years ago, the first sturgeon swam into existence along the shores of Pangaea. A model of Earth rotates. A surgeon moves swiftly through the sea. This is back when dinosaurs ruled the planet. Brontosaurus gather along a river. Before flowering plants and birds even existed. A shark swims in deep water. Like sharks, another ancient fish, the sturgeon settled on a body design built to last featuring bony scoots, a multi-sensory snout, and an asymmetrical shark-like tail. Today, 25 species of sturgeon swim Earth's rivers, lakes, and seas. Three men travel in a small boat. This is the story of the Gulf sturgeon and the biologists who are deciphering their ancient code. The sturgeon glides slowly in murky water. See you later, buddy. It moves farther underwater. Text, The Fishery. Ms. Oldland? Luella Oldland, 1962, Florida Folk Festival. Well, it has been 48 years since I settled on the mouth of Swanee River, right on the main Northwest Path. And I was supposed to tell you a story of the sturgeon. When we went in there, the fishing was industrial. And they fall we mullet feet. A school of mullet swims close to the surface. In the spring, my husband sturgeon fish. Photos show Lowell and Eric. Sturgeon fish is a great big fish. It weighs at least from two to three hundred pounds. A net lays over a riverbed. Those fish was caught in big nets, sixteen inch stretch mass. They were tied by the tail and tied to stakes to keep them alive until shipping day. A photo of sturgeon hanging on a line. Then they were butchered and carried to Cedar Keys, where they were iced up and shipped to New York. The Statue of Liberty stands in the harbor. Well, in those sturgeon is what we call caviar, which is rose and the other fish. Black row fills a spoon. Commercial fishing for Gulf sturgeon began here in the Suwannee River of Florida back in 1896. The river appears on the western tip. The fishery quickly spread throughout the sturgeon's range. Arrows point to nine Gulf Coast rivers. European immigrants in the U.S. created a new market for sturgeon meat and their eggs, called caviar. A person spoons caviar onto toast. Historically, they collected along the Gulf Coast, this side, over 400,000 pounds of sturgeon. And that's, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a number of fish. From 1901 to 1902. After that, they just went down. 
There were no regulations on fishing, hunting, or logging back then. Logs fill a truck bed. Targeting egg-bearing females for caviar was not sustainable. After surviving millions of years, one decade of over-harvest from 1900 to 1910 brought catastrophic declines to the Gulf sturgeon. Local markets with less intense fishing continued for decades, like the Odalins. In 1910, Eric and Luella married, and they moved to their new island home on the mouth of the Suwannee River to raise their family. A sepia photo shows the couple posing with six kids. Eric stopped sturgeon fishing in 1926. He became a fishing guide until his death. A headstone. Eric Goodland, 1874 to 1941. My grandfather was a dreamer. He dreamed of better things for his family. He dreamed of better things for him. My name is Bessie Christina Barber. I am a granddaughter of Alec and Luella Odland. I'm Catherine, and I was a daughter of Oscar Odland. He was the only son of Llewellyn Eric Odlin. He and my grandmother were buried on the island with two of their daughters that died. It's a monument to them and what they've accomplished. We can come and think about them and the many things that they've done. From above, an island house. Over the decades, our culture of harvesting sturgeon for food began transforming into a culture of conservation. Alan Huff, Archie Carr, and Stephen Carr conducted the first scientific research on the sturgeon in the 1970s and 80s, often with help from the last generation of commercial fishermen. Fred Tatman, last commercial fisherman. They discovered a scarce population in their mark and recapture studies. A sturgeon is released. So, in 1984, with the population in peril, Florida banned all fishing for Gulf sturgeon. Seven years later, the sturgeon was listed as a federally threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The era of sturgeon harvest was over. The era of research to understand and protect the species began. A person returns a sturgeon to the river. Text, where art thou? We wanted to learn early as to where the sturgeon were. We put out wanted posters from Louisiana to the Suwannee River just to get information as a start. A commercial fisherman provided us with nets, showed us some methods, and we went out and fished in areas that he suggested we go in and collected sturgeon. They fish from a standing boat. What? What? Got one. Hello? Yeah. Got one there. He pulls in a net. I got him by the tail. And we were basically tagging adults just to try to determine uh, movement in the systems. They return the tagged sturgeon to the river. Wow. Today, we use internal pit tags to mark individuals, including juveniles. A small sturgeon's gills expand. A quick scan reveals any recaptures. A woman glides a scanner over the fish. It is a recap, it's an old pit tag. We've been putting new pit tags in those old. It's a, it's a non-3D three. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's old, an yeah. old recap. So, so this the tag that's in this fish, it goes back at least 20 years probably. And as we collected them, we started to take tissue for genetics. We did satellite tags with the fish early on to determine, well, when the fish left the river systems, where did they go? A sturgeon swims along the riverbed. This combination of tracking technology, genetics, and mark recapture work began revealing the incredible journey of the Gulf sturgeon. They release a large sturgeon. Later, buddy. There you go. Good job. 
Adult sturgeon migrate between the Gulf of Mexico and the river where they were born. They spend late spring, summer, and early fall in the river, then overwinter in the estuaries and Gulf of Mexico. Ike Worgen determined that there were several different groups of genetics across the Gulf. Colored dots move on a coastal map. If they are mature and ready, they spawn upriver during spring. The conventional wisdom is they're just like salmon and they home to the same river that they recognize chemically. We don't know if that's how they recognize the river. The sun shines in an underwater view. Now, we use surgically implanted acoustic tags to track sturgeon between the river, estuary, and gulf. A man pulls up a round device on a pole from the side of a boat. Ah, so this is one of our acoustic receivers. Handiest little piece of gear ever created by mankind. It uh, sits along the river here, and it picks up tags from our acoustic tag fish. And all it does is it just has a clock inside, and it just logs them in as they come along. It says, you know, Bob was here on July 10th. That's 2 p.m. The boat speeds along the river. What we started to find out is that the sturgeon, when they came in the river systems, they were occupying certain areas that were very discreet, and we call those summer resting areas. You know, you had a river system that was, say, the Apalachicola, which is over 100 miles long, but yet you only had maybe a half a dozen different small locations where the sturgeon would hang out. Why are they in these particular areas? And you found out, well, OK, maybe it was the depth of the water or uh, the flow, the current, or there was a spring nearby. So there are several hundred gulf sturgeon in a deep hole that's right off the mouth of this spring. The currents are quiet, so they can save a considerable amount of energy by just hovering at depth in these holding areas. So they're just hanging out. A sturgeon lays still underwater. The adults, subadults, they don't eat in the river during the summer. When they go out in the fall, October, November, I tell you, they really put the feed bag on. I mean, they come back most of the time to the same system they left. Fat, they've gained weight. It's a different fish. They feed by suction feeding. They're like vacuum cleaners. They suck in the sediment, somehow manage to swallow whatever is in there, little worms and little shrimps and things. The sturgeon swim past in lower depths, stirring up debris as they move. This fish has no teeth, you know, so this may look like a river monster, but you check out its mouth. I mean, it's, it's just like a tube-like, sucker-like mouth with no teeth in here. They're a benthic bottom feeder, so they've got this snout coming out, this rostrum coming out. They've got these barbels hanging down, and this thing is loaded with all sorts of sensors. And then the mouth is on the bottom, and it shoots out and downwards and sucks back in to inhale food, and then it spits out the sediment through the gills. Text, Suwannee River Estuary. It takes three years of feeding out in the Gulf of Mexico for them to build up a batch of several hundred thousand eggs that each female will spawn eventually. Oh, look at that. Feed from the chow and down. Look at that little rotund belly, fat bullet boy. Holding a young sturgeon. So that's a very beautiful fish. Nicely fed, nice round belly. Breathing like crazy. He's doing good. Text the spawning grounds. The most discouraging setback in our sturgeon project has been the failure to find their spawning ground. Dr. Archie Carr, 1984. A rocky bank that's covered with trees stands next to the peaceful river. You would never know in the springtime that there are maybe 500 sturgeon up here on these spawning grounds. Indian Ledge Spawning Area, Suwannee. The spawning takes place in the spring when the water is high and fast and they're coming up the river, the males come up early, and they wait for the females to come about a month later. What they're looking for is an area with fast flowing water, and they want gravel, and then the eggs stick there. Clumps of gravel cover the riverbed. In the 1990s, biologists found the first spawning grounds. 
thanks to tracking technology and floor buffing pads. The water surface ripples. We put out pads to collect the eggs just to verify, well, this is where they did spawn. They examine row on the boat. And we collected the eggs. In fact, we took the eggs back to our office where we uh, hatched them just to be sure that they were sturgeon. Apalachicola River. Jim Woodruff Dam was closed up in the late 50s. And that prevented the sturgeon from utilizing a lot of the spawning habitat in the Flint River. We found that they spawn up near the dam. They spawn where there's good hard rock, cobble, limestone. Rock stands on the shore of the Indian Ledge spawning area. And we've been calling this area Indian Ledge because when we came here to investigate the spawning of sturgeon, we kept finding artifacts, uh, hide scrapers and knives made out of chert. A collection of rock tools lays on the ground. Dr. Sulik paddles a small boat. It turns out that sturgeon spawn in the spring and the fall. It's not the same fish. And that's really a sort of a safety valve for the population. So if things are bad in the spring, they've got the potential to make up for that by spawning in the fall. Dots move over the coastal map. To date, we found spawning locations in six of the seven rivers. The Pearl River remains a mystery. On the map, the Pearl River is in the western area of the Gulf. Text, why do they jump? A sturgeon rises above the surface and dives. Text, they have no teeth, no temper, only a pressing mysterious urge to jump all summer long. Abby Goodenough, New York Times, Bobby Jones, resident. A few years ago, I was fishing one morning, coming up the river, and, and they were jumping everywhere. I mean, so I slowed down, you know, and just on a plane, just probably seven, eight miles an hour, had a big wide John boat. And the minute one jumped in my boat right here below the river, and trust me, uh, that was kind of scary. It is dangerous passing over these leaping holes, as they are called, many a canoe and small boat having been overset by the fall of a sturgeon into it. Mark Catesby, early 1780s. Ah, yes, the old question of why do sturgeon jump? Sign, danger, jumping sturgeon. I heard they jump to get their own barnacles and stuff off of parasites. Ah, uh, no, 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 no self-respecting parasite's gonna come off with a jump. Come on now. <laughs> the sturgeon came out and jumped right over the bow of the boat, right down the other side. <laughs> Only time that's ever happened. Well, we found out that in order for them to hover near the bottom without spending any energy, they need to be the same density as the water. And so they adjust that by the amount of air that's inflated in that swim bladder. About every two days or so, that swim bladder has shrunk and needs to be reinflated. And while they're jumping, they swallow air and then they dive back down. And in the process of diving back down, they compress that and reestablish their buoyancy. A sturgeon swishes its fin. In summertime, the adults aren't feeding in the river. So they go offshore, they feed in the wintertime. In the summertime, they're trying to save energy. And the best way to save energy is to stay in one place as much as you can. So they do the jump, get their buoyancy balanced, and then they can spend a lot more time without having to work. Makes sense. I appreciate it. I never talked to anybody that had any knowledge of how they do anything. The only time public sees a gulf sturgeon is when they jump. A boat zooms past the jumping sturgeon. There'd been several jumped in and injured people, but they got these boats are so fast now and then all, and they, they don't just people just don't think about things like that, you know, anymore. When boating over summer resting areas, a high-speed collision with a 200-pound fish can be damaging, even deadly. Sign, caution, in memory of Jalen Rippey, 2009 to 2015. They don't jump to attack people. It's, you know, jumping is a natural behavior. They're not evil, they're not trying to hurt people. <laughs> people are in the river and the sturgeon are in the river and so coincidences happen. 
it's unfortunate that there are some uh, you know, incidences when these things jump and people um, come in contact with them, but otherwise, you know, they're not trying to harm you and they're, they're just very, um, very calm. He holds a sturgeon in the water. A sturgeon, when they're underwater, talk to each other to make a series of clicks. So three clicks in a row, then a jump, and another click is the characteristic sound of a jumping sturgeon. And so the jump has been incorporated into a, a pattern of communication. By the end of the summer, the jump becomes more of a hop. Sturgeon perform low dives. Text, recovering a gentle giant. The sun rises over the Suwannee River. So we're gonna spend a day and a half on the river and cover about 100 kilometers of the river. We're imaging the bottom of the channel. All of these shadows on the left-hand side are sturgeon, right below where the spring run plume is entering the river. They're big. I mean, they're all over a meter. From above, hundreds of sturgeon. This is the most major holding area on the Suwannee River, between 500 and 1,000 fish. So we're doing this technique in um, all of the Florida rivers now, then use models to estimate the abundance of fish in the reach that we scanned. In a day and a half, we could, we could scan and count 4,000 sturgeon. You certainly couldn't catch 4,000 sturgeon in a day on the water. The largest population today is on the Suwannee River with about 15,000 fish. The Choctahatchee supports the second largest population. Access to spawning habitat in both rivers is not blocked by any upstream dams. Jackson Bluff Dam. Recovery appears slower in the Apalachicola, Escambia, Pascagoula, and Pearl Rivers because of human alterations like dams, river dredging, shipping channels, shrimp trawlers, and pollution from industrial plants. The western area of the Sturgeon's Range also receives more frequent hurricanes. We have an enormous amount of water coming down the rivers. The dissolved oxygen goes down real low, and sturgeon need a lot of oxygen. So there's these natural mortality events that occur periodically, that, which no one can prevent. A rainbow appears in the sky over the river. Currently, there are research teams working in all seven rivers from spring to fall. Most projects today explore what the juveniles are up to. We're catching them after they've come back up from the estuary as young a year or two, year three, four at this point. He takes a young sturgeon from a net. Probably a one-year-old fish spawned last year. Melissa has got some parasites. We know for the first several months of their life, they are eating only in the river. The question of how many cows can you raise in a field? So how many juveniles can recruit out of a given river each year? Mark Dericolet. So we've actually caught all of these fish before. Uh, these are all recaptures. And so when they're real small like this, they have extra spiky scoots, which probably helps them uh, from being predated upon. We've gone through and tagged this guy and Gotten genetics from him and it's ready to go. I'm sure we'll see him again. He grins and returns him to the Apalachicola. If given the chance, a gulf sturgeon can live to be well over 40. Once we create an ecological portrait of the gulf sturgeon in each river, including the juveniles, we can begin restoration projects to enhance recovery of the species. The gulf sturgeon almost disappeared, like the dinosaurs. A prehistoric fish appears in a clip. So once they were left alone, they had a chance to reproduce. And it takes the males about eight to 10 years to get mature, and the females about 15 to 20 years. 50 years ago, the last commercial fishermen passed their knowledge on finding and catching sturgeon to pioneering biologists. These biologists, from Florida to Louisiana, 
pass their growing knowledge to the next generation of researchers. Individual photos show biologists, then they pose outside as a group. I've always enjoyed this group of young biologists that are up and coming. I mean, just to watch them work and you know that the fish is going to be uh, taken care of. They're going to learn some stuff. Whatever you've learned throughout your time, you want to pass that on to someone. Science, technology, and dedicated biologists revealed the Gulf sturgeon is an ancient wanderer. A large sturgeon in clear water. The abilities of the Gulf sturgeon to use open habitats in big rivers, estuaries, and the Gulf feed on vast numbers of minute prey and exist off stored energy for many months. 55 uh, kilograms are the secrets of their success over millions of years. The technology and world around them changes, but this gentle giant remains immutable. A sturgeon jumps near a boat dock then descends to the riverbed. Credits, produced by Adam Kayser, filmed, directed and edited by Jennifer Brown, Into Nature Films. Funding courtesy U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Southeast Aquatic Resources and Partnership. Special thanks. In honor and memory of the King and Queen of the Suwannee, Eric and Luella Udland. Oh, oh, that, now you're really getting it. <laughs> She's like, I'm going back to the deep.